the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O heavenly King and Comforter, Spirit of Truth, which art in all places and fillest all things, treasure of goodness and giver of life incorruptible, come and abide in us. Cleanse us from all that defileth, guide us in full truth, give utterance at the opening of our mouth, and save our souls, O Thou who art good. Most Holy Mother of God, pray to God for us. All, all the saints pray to God for us. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Church of Passion Mission slash Saint Solon Parish. I am Father Theodore, and I am one of the deacons at the parish and at the mission. I'm the director of the community here. I had something written uh, to introduce Father Zacharias to you, but under his obedience, I'm going to be as simple as possible. I want you to read this. But what I'm going to say is something I mentioned to the Jews last night, uh, who basically follows up rises, and the connection that we have to them, and it's a very, very big connection. For those of you that don't know, Father Zacharias is the spiritual son and disciple of Saint Sophron, or Elder Sophron, from Essex. Elder Sophron was a spiritual son of Saint Silouan, which makes Father Zacharias the spiritual grandchild of Saint Silouan. It is truly a blessing to have Father Zacharias and Father Bartholomew with us today, and for this, this part of the week, it's been truly a blessing. And without further ado, I'm just going to allow Father to speak. So if you have um, to ask you have questions, lead me to the end, please. Father Theodore gave a genealogy. It reminds me of the genealogies we read in the Gospel. That number of people before Christ, the righteous ancestors of the Lord before his coming. But now, the new Israel, it is us, the Christians. And there are, no, there are now descendants of the Lord, not ancestors. We are all the children of God. We are all the children of the saints. God created, he didn't create masters and servants, but he created fathers and sons. And the sons in their turn, they become fathers. This is the gift of the children of God. But it's nice to remember these genealogies and to derive some useful conclusions. In the genealogy that precedes the coming of our Lord, we see that people were numbered, people who believed in God's word, People who believed in God's promises and they received the circumcision of the flesh to mark their belonging to him. And they were the people expecting his coming, the coming of the Savior of the world. And now we, the children of God, the descendants of the Lord, which he has purchased, which which he has purchased with his holy blood. We are also the people who believed in his name, who received his word. We are the people who, who have been baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And we have received again a circumcision to mark our belonging to him. This time, the circumcision is not of the flesh, 
is not made by the hand of man. It is a circumcision of the spirit, a circumcision of the heart. Belonging to God are those people who have this circumcision of the heart, which is observed as being a contrite spirit, a humble heart that clings to God. It's the only way to relate with the God of the Christians, who is the, who is the Father of mercies and God of every consolation. It's the only way to relate with Him if we approach Him with a contrite heart and a humble spirit. And we have this circumcision of the heart to remind us continually, not to forget one moment, that we belong to Him, and that we have to live by His word. And expect <coughs> to live by His word, for the sake of the word of His mother, to keep to the heart path, and to expect His second coming. He has come, he remains with us until the end of the world, but he is coming again in a special way to judge both the living and the dead. So, a few words about the genealogy, the genealogy that provoked Father Theodore this, this morning. For, for me, this genealogy is a judgment. It's a difficult thing because people have been known since even how great he was here, but he was a phenomenon. In him, all the spiritual and theological tradition of the, of the church was recapitulated. And Father Sufroni was his, was his spiritual son, not less than him. But when it comes to me, it is only a judgment. Because people having seen such great things in those people, they expect from us poor people the same thing. And we haven't got anything of that. But we just, we did what they said. We extrapolate on what they said. And we hope to serve in that way the people who come to us to serve them in their own salvation and also in ours. It's a very humbling thing. Today's theme, I want to read you a, a little pa paper. It's 37 and a half minutes. I'll read you a prayer. And then we can have a discussion. I find that this is the best way. Sometimes people prefer not that, that I don't read papers because I read clumsily. But uh, so I'll read this paper and then we still have time to, to discuss. The theme of today's talk is the world's lack of care for salvation, which is despondency. The world's lack of care for salvation, that is despondency, the world's despondency, and the zeal of the children of God. Through disobedience we fell into sin, and now all find ourselves in a state contrary to nature. If we were, if we were in a state according to nature, we would love God with all our heart and with all our being, and our mind would not be separated even for a moment from the remembrance of Him, of His holy name. This is what we, this is what we are taught by the saints, who think of God more often than they breathe. And here I may say, unless the name of Christ is stuck to our breath, we cannot become spiritual. We cannot progress. It is like that. 
Their breath is joined to the name of God as they continually invoke and call upon it, not only with their lips, but also with their hearts. Because God notices only when we speak to Him from our heart, only when we pray to Him from our heart, only when we confess to Him from our heart, only when we eat charity from our heart, only when we stand before Him with our deep heart turned to Him. In our spiritual ministry as priests, repeatedly we hear in confession, even from elect Christians, comments such as this, I am not stable in the way of the Lord. I do not pray as I ought to. My mind is full of thoughts of the vanity of the world. The gospel world, the gospel world remains inactive in my life. I do not have a, a hope that is alive in God's promises. Neither do I have the incorruptible consolation of the Holy Spirit. I am not inspired. My mind is not clear. I have withered away. I have withered away and my, and my heart is dead. And many other similar things we hear in confession. Cert certainly, the world around us cultivates, cultivates forgetfulness of God by the lure of its carnal standards, corrupting us with its, with its spirit that fights against God. As the Holy Scripture has written, the carnal mind is enmity against God and weighs down the soul with deadly dejection because friendship of the world is enmity with God. Our whole struggle, therefore, is how to overcome our state contrary to nature in its separation from God and active, sorry, and arrive at the natural state often referred to as supernatural, that is, our spirit to be united with the Spirit of God. In order to achieve this, we have to war against our passions and the bad habits we have acquired in this world. There are many kinds of passions, pride, love of money, sorrow, the passion of uncleanness. It is clear that the devil uses these to fight, us, to fight us and to separate us from God. Nevertheless, there is one passion which is the most fearful of all, namely despondency. In Greek, akiria, which means not simply laziness, but lack of care for salvation. In spiritual terminology, despondency means spiritual laziness, a lack of care for eternal salvation, whereas the struggle with different passions can lead to a greater, to a great spiritual profit. Despondency brings completely forgetfulness of God, thereby slaying the soul in the literal sense, without any resistance, being brought about by the wretched victim. The passion of despondency is very dangerous because it wipes out the memory of God from the mind. When someone is in a state of despondency, he can undertake many efforts except that of working for his salvation. This is why one may observe monks who have fallen into despondency becoming particularly active, building castles. That is, <coughs> instead of being constantly in the presence of God and in an, un un and the, and the an uninterrupted converse with Him, they undertake many tasks yet they are bereft of the worth of spiritual changes of the heart, which continually 
reaches out with longing towards God, its benefactor. Therefore, spiritual despondency is one thing, but another is the ordinary kind of psychological despondency which tries to avoid any effort. In fact, all the discoveries, the scientific discoveries on which modern technology is built, they were made by monks in the Middle Ages who fell in despondency about their spiritual life and they started, started making exper experiments and observing natural phenomena. All our civilization is the result of spiritual despondency. Despondency either comes from pride or despair. Pride dries up the heart and separates man from life in communion with God, as well as with one's brother. Separated alone and deprived, and deprived of the communion of grace which abounds in the church, the body of Christ, Man becomes weak and cannot withstand the spirit of the enemy and the famine of sin that corrupts his life. In order to find some force and <coughs> in order to find some force and fleeting comfort, he hands he hands himself over to the passion of dishonor, which deadens which deadened his soul, rendering it incapable of standing in the wondrous place of the Divine Presence and from savoring God's incorruptible consolation. When we give space to pride in whatever form, criticism, contempt, indifference, not only is grace chased away from within us, but even the memory of God is. The lamentable state of delusion which a man who has handed himself over to, to the deadly passion of despondency finds himself in is accurately accurate described by the great Apostle Paul, rather by the Holy Spirit of God in him, in these words. Let us sit and drink, for tomorrow we die. This is the true description of this spiritual despondency. The corrupting passion of despondency can also be born of despair. Despair is the unavoidable result of this belief. This passion empties the heart of hope and desire for the life to come. There is nothing sadder than a man to be living in the world with a heart that is empty and deprived of inspiration and divine comfort. The most tragic thing is to live with an empty heart. In the holy institution of monasticism, life is structured around helping the monk to activate an awareness of God and the sensation of warm, joy, comfort, and peace, which this wondrous supernatural presence of God creates in the heart. However, when man's relationship with Christ becomes dead through unbelief, man no longer hopes in the resurrection according to the words of the Lord, where our treasure is, there will our heart be also. If our treasure is in God, God is love, and our heart will be full of love, which is a wondrous content of the, of the heart. But if we love the things and the passions of this world, we become like earth, and dust, and the heart that empty. If we have a living home within us, our heart anchors in heaven, and we are made rich 
because that is where our treasure is. When we have no hope, our heart cannot be detached from the earth. It becomes earth. Those who have no hope in the resurrection and eternal life have already from this life a foretaste of the inconsolable torment of their separation from the living and bountiful God of love. That is indeed a spiritual death which forebodes the eternal death of hell. Consequently, the Christian's whole struggle is aimed at overcoming despondency which paralyzes the soul and brings about spiritual death. In his high priestly prayer, the Lord says, it's in the, it's in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 17. In his high priestly prayer, the Lord says, This is life eternal, that they might know thee the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. In other words, eternity is a personal state which is important to man when he cultivates with faith, when he cultivates with faith and keeps alive and keeps alive his relationship with the personal God of revelation. Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Of course, because we have boldness and access towards God through our Lord Jesus Christ, it is clear that our relationship with Him acquires absolute importance for our victory over sin and for us to inherit Him and for us to inherit eternal salvation. Our relationship with Christ, which begins now on earth, initially with faith, and which will continue in eternity with divine love, is a unique gift which we have to which we have to rekindle all the time during our life, so that we journey dynamically to a more perfect knowledge of God and union and union with Him. True Christian life is going from more fullness of divine love to a greater fullness of divine love. What theory, what theory and which thoughts form the basis of this great miracle known by the created world, namely the union of the heart of man with the Spirit of God? There is not a greater miracle in the whole created world, in the whole universe than the union of man's heart with God. And now we must see how we come to that. We are given the theory in Holy Scripture. We learn there that from the excess of His goodness, God formed man's heart in a unique way, suitable and capable of receiving its Creator, when he would come into the world for the salvation of all, and that it was the target of his visitation from evening until morning, and from morning until evening, in order to take care of man and make him in the image of his son, that is, a God according to grace, he conceived such a great plan for him that he even spared not his own son in order to fulfill it, in order to fulfill this plan. Certainly, if man occupied the mind of God before the foundation of the world, then he must indeed be sublime in his origin and his destination, and wondrous in the potential hidden in his nature which is made in the image of God. This theory inspires faith, which is activated by love and gratitude. Through thanksgiving to God for His kind providence, 
the believer is enriched with spiritual gifts. The grace we receive is in proportion to the gratitude we show receiving the gifts of God. As a great saint of the church says, God measures out his gifts to men according to their gratitude with which they received them. So Maximus the Confessor. Thus, we enter the blessed fullness of God's grace. The greater the gratitude and glory we offer him, the more abundant is the measure of his gifts to us. By thanksgiving, man acquires a hypostasis in the sight of God, a standing in the sight of God, and his life has value in eternity, so that in the day of his glorious coming, he will be able to stand in his unshakable presence. Another saint of the church says that continuous thanksgiving intercedes before God for our weakness. That is to say, when we thank continually God, it makes up for what we are lacking. Moreover, with the gifts that he has, the believer enters into the communion of the gifts of the other members of the body of Christ, the saints, and all the Lord's elect upon earth in every place of his dominion. In this, rich, in this rich assembly of grace, which the believer enters through thanksgiving and gratitude, he forgets about the smaller gifts he has had, and reaches out to a greater fullness of love and perfection, hungry and thirsty for the gift of God. One who thanks God is a stranger to despondency. Sorry. One who thanks God is a stranger to despondency, yet is overcome by a blessed sadness because he cannot thank God in a manner worthy of him for all his benefits, even for every breath of air which he pours, which he pours out upon the face of the earth. This is a blessed state to grieve before God that we cannot thank him worthily as we owe him and as it befits him. Consequently, thanksgiving such as this leads to true repentance to which there is no end in this life. Repentance from gratitude and thanksgiving is a life-giving repentance that never ends. It's so dynamic. Then we understand why in his gospel the Lord places self-condemnation out of gratitude above all the commandments, deeming that we are useless and unworthy even when we have fulfilled all his commandments. This is the greatest, listen to this, this is the greatest commandment of the New Testament. The Lord says, so likewise ye, when he shall have done all those things which are commanded you, when you fulfill all the commandments, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. This is the greatest commandment of the New Testament. Such a spirit preserves divine grace fervent in the lives of the faithful. And this leads to inspiration that saves by sending away dead deathly despondency and giving one the strength to daily perfect holiness in the fear of God. The way of thanksgiving heals us from the passion of pride and strengthens us against the temptation of despair. Thanksgiving heals us from both. Thanksgiving and gratitude equal humility. These virtues are from the noblest forms of humility. And Holy Scripture, both old and new, confirms this saying, 
God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Consequently, it is important for us to remember that God's blessing and grace increase within us with humility, but in particular with thanksgiving. When we enter the grace of thanksgiving, we acquire the right kind of godly seed, which befits the children of God. Those who thank God never fall into despair, and their heart is never empty of his consolation. The following example illustrates illustrates this well. It's a case really to be remembered always. It's a, it's something which happened to a Christian of our days. A certain Christian confessed that he wanted to commit suicide because everything was going wrong. There was only pain in his life and it lacked meaning. The spiritual father then asked him if there was anything good in his life. If, for instance, he was breathing and alive at that moment. He replied, his reply was positive. And then the spiritual father told him, stop thanking God for the breath he gives you, for your physical life. And then for anything else, God reveals that you have received as a gift from him. The man indeed started to thank God that he could be that he could breathe and that he was alive, and he began to feel stronger with him. Then he thanked God for knowing his name. And then that he received consolation from prayer in his holy name. Finally, his, his thanksgiving was so warm and fervent that he completely forgot about his despair and suicide and escaped this de demonic temptation. According to the teaching of the fathers, there is no greater virtue in the sight of God than the giving of, than the giving of thanks when afflicted with illness, persecution, injustice, or the rejection of men. We are all aware of that such things. We all suffer such things. It pleases God, it pleases God when we are in pain and say and still say to him, Glory to thee, O God. I thank thee, O Lord, for all that thou hast done for me. When we are in pain and death threatens our life, if we say these words, they have a meaning and they derive such a strength that overcomes them. When they, are, when, when they were dragging St. John Chrysostom into, a, into exile, ill, much afflicted, and maltreated, they passed by a church. Then the saint asked them, the saint asked them, to let him stay for a while in front of the holy altar of that church, on which he lived and said to God, Glory be to thee, O Lord, for everything. And at that moment, he gave his holy soul into the hands of God. <coughs> Wonderful and glorious, and glorious end, because our coming to earth has only one purpose, to give one glory to God. When our life is in danger, there is no attitude more pleasing to God than thanksgiving. If in that moment of pain we cling to God with our mind and say to Him, I thank the Lord for everything, neither death nor any other soul can separate me from Thee, for Thou art He that doth over, for Thou art He that that doth overcome death. Then it means that our faith has become greater than that, greater than the death which threatens our life. You understand? I'm sorry for my clumsy reading. 
This is a great feat in the sight of God, which carries us over to the other shore. In other words, it leads us into a dynamic life, into the blessed communion of all the saints, into an everlasting doxology and thanksgiving to God throughout all ages in His kingdom. The divine liturgy is a great means given to us for fighting against the passion of despondency and overcoming spiritual death which threatens our life and slays us and slays us spiritually. In the liturgy we learn what the Apostle says, that is, first to offer up great thanksgiving to God and then humbly with shame because of our spiritual weakness to make our petitions for all that we need of Him. This is well pleasing to God. He gives His grace and gradually light and gradually light and the feeling of His presence increases in the heart. A small light generates a, generates a bigger and a, and a bigger one until the great day shines in our heart. As the prophet Solomon says, and Christ dwells in our heart through faith. The divine liturgy is where we are taught how to give perfect thanks to the Almighty and beloved God in a manner in a manner worthy of Him. The divine liturgy is the cross and the resurrection at the same time because the body and the blood of the Lord which we receive contains the same grace and the same blessing which His body had after the resurrection, after the cross and resurrection, when He ascended ascend into heaven. The divine liturgy is the expression of our gratitude, especially for the passion, the cross and the resurrection of our Lord. This is why in the heart of the liturgy we hear, take, eat, this is my body. This body, the Lord says, which I offered, which I lifted up upon the cross, I led into the grave, and I raised up into the, into the heavens, resurrected, but which I left in the earth on the night of the last supper, so that you may partake of it and know the grace, partake of it, and in all the grace which accompanies it, because in it dwells the fullness of divinity. In the words that follow, we hear, Drink ye all of it, this is my blood the blood which I poured out on the cross as a ransom for the sins and for the salvation of the whole world. Therefore, when we repeat, when we repeat these words at every liturgy, it is as if we are saying to Him, To Thee, O Lord, is due all thanksgiving, all glory, every blessing, because thou hast offered thy body and thy blood as a nourishment for us, so that we may be saved and live for all eternity. Of course, in heaven and on earth, there is no other subject or theory that occupies the souls of the saints than Christ's saving sacrifice. They can never thank Him enough for that. The study of God's indescribable love towards us strengthens the soul of the righteous to always remain in an everlasting thanksgiving and doxology of joy and love, of joy and love, worthy of God who is holy and good.
The Apostle Paul says, for, a, for every creature, the Apostle Paul says, for every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused. If it be received with thanksgiving, is from the first epistle to Timothy 4.4. 4. Everything in our life is sanctified if we receive it with the giving of thanks. When we offer thanksgiving to God, all things, every object and every creature become a means of salvation for us. For us. God's words are, take it, bring ye all of it, this is my blood. The divine liturgy is founded on these words and continues in the prayer that as God fulfilled these great and saving mysteries which remain forever, may he come and fill everything with the Holy Spirit. Then at the end of the liturgy we can chant a new and triumphal hymn. But before we say this, I want to explain to, to explain better. We always base ourselves on the words of the Lord. And then we make an entreaty, a prayer. And the liturgy is based on the words of the Lord. Hey, eat, this is my body. Drink ye all of it, this is my blood. These are the words of the Lord, the words of institution, the words of the foundation of this mystery. And you proceed and say, Lord, as you said that, and it was true at that time, so now also send thy Holy Spirit and make these gifts again, thy body and thy blood. You understand? We base ourselves on the words of the Lord, and then we make an entreaty, a prayer. And this is the pattern of the prayer of the church always, to base ourselves in the words of the Lord, and then to proceed in prayer, fasting, that which he did once and remains forever, to send us the grace and make again this event true, so that we are helped to enter the one event in eternity, which is the mystery of his cross and resurrection. I hope I explain it properly, but maybe we can come back to that again. If we, if, we, if we approach God in that way, then we we'll succeed in, make, in making an exchange in the liturgy. Offer our life to Him, and the exchange, the exchange is unequal, and He offers His life to us by feeling the gifts we offer to Him, the, insi the insignificant gifts we offer to Him, He fills them with His life. If we have put all our life in those, thing, in those things we offer him, bread and wine, all our faith, all our love, all our repentance, all our humility, all our, all our life, all our expectation we have of him, then he'll do the same. He'll fill the gifts with his life and return them to us. And we have this exchange of, of our little life with the boundless life of God in the liturgy. Then, having, having succeeded to make this exchange in the liturgy, we sing a triumphal hymn after the communion. Listen to it. We have seen the true light. We have received the heavenly spirit. We have found the true faith. We worship the undivided trinity for the same hath saved us. That's the triumphal song of the people of God having having succeeded in making their exchange with God, the, the exchange of their life with the life of God. And when they taste of, of the benefits, of the comfort, of the consolation of this exchange, they become mad about the liturgy. And they always come to the liturgy with an ever new desire to make a better and better and better exchange. This is the new song of the children of God, which they chant every day in the liturgy out of gratitude and love. 
Such is the zeal and inspiration of Christians who have been born again and have attended the, little, the divine liturgy. In order, for, in order for the zeal of the children of God not to draw back, it must keep it up. My soul is not worthy. If the just draws back, says the Lord, my soul is not well pleased. So, in order for the zeal of the children of God not to draw back, who represent the cherubim and the seraphim at the, at the divine liturgy, the thanksgiving must be complete and be offered with extensive tension. We thank thee for all whereof we know and whereof we know not, who benefits both manifest and hid, which thou hast wrought upon us, we say in the liturgy. Of course, the things that God has done for us, which we cannot see, are more because the eyes of our soul are not open and enlightened. Like we have physical eyes, we have inner eyes, the eyes of the heart, or the eye of the heart, which is cleansed through thanksgiving to see more and more the benefits of God. And you hear that slowly, how St. Paul speaks about that. Of course, the things that God has done for us, which we cannot see, are more because the eyes of our soul are not open and enlightened. Yet we believe in what we are taught by the Church, and in what the Divine Liturgy prays for. This is why the Liturgy has such warmth a flame of thanksgiving and gratitude. In the, in the central hymn of the Divine Liturgy, we chant, We hymn thee, we bless thee, we give thanks unto thee, O Lord, and we pray unto thee, our God. Three verbs here of thanksgiving and glory, and one only of entreaty are used here. Because God the Savior has already accomplished everything for us. He has given us all that we need for our soul to remain united with His Spirit and for us to enter His never-ending blessedness. The only thing that is left is for our body to become incorrupt. And this He will grant us in the age to come where we'll be like the angels of God in his kingdom after, after the resurrection of the bodies, as the Lord said to the Sadducees. Despite all this, we must not forget that our participation in the abundance of life which the Lord offer, offers us in the liturgy depends upon how, how much we have prepared in our closet in our closet, how much we have prepared in our closet the day before, but every day as well. <coughs> our whole life ought to be a single preparation for a worthy presentation or a worthy standing before God in His house and for thanking Him with all our heart as we owe Him. I said to you that my poor presentation will finish in 37 and a half minutes, but as I keep com making comments, it will last a bit longer. I have four pages more to do. So, the Apostle Paul says that we are all members of the body of Christ. When we graft a wild olive tree, it grows into a tame olive tree. This is what the Church does in baptism. It grafts us onto the body of Christ. This is precisely the purpose of baptism, to engraft us onto the body of Christ. In order for us, however, to be living members of the body, each one must guard his gift from God. The Apostle says that every man has his proper gift of God. Each member has his unique gift, 
which he must cultivate in order to continue being a living member of this body. Okay, you cannot be a, body, a member of this body without the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is precisely the purpose of baptism. Yes, yes, yes. Each member has his unique gift which he must cultivate in order to continue being a living member of this body. Our preparation before the liturgy is our cultivation of the gift God gave us to become a Christian. One way of preparing it is by praying on our own for a period of time before the liturgy and then going to church with our heart full of warmth, faith, love, hope, expectation in the Lord's mercy and full of spiritual humble dispositions. That is an offering, a gift we bring to God and the church and to the assembly of the brethren who have gathered together in the temple. The gift that we cultivate when we are alone unites us with the body of Christ. <coughs> it leads us into the communion of all the other gifts of the other members of, of Christ's body, the saints in heaven and also of his elect upon earth, so that in truth we become rich. We enter a rich communion of gifts. In monasteries, monks also have their daily prayer rule, which they do not consider to be a burden. On the contrary, it is an honor and privilege given to them to help them enter the communion of the grace of God, the communion of the gifts of the brethren who are their fellow strugglers. Consequently, the more we cultivate our gift when we are alone, the more we shall be prepared when we come to church to enter this blessed communion of gifts, the blessed communion of those who possess the gifts, the blessed communion of the grace of God. For the grace of God gathers the church and like a mother helps and, insp and inspires the faithful with her prayers and liturgies and upwards impetus while the saints while the saints who are the glorified members of the body of Christ put them up with their prayers and intercessions. This is the meaning of, of church, having a helpful push from below and the saving pool from above. This is the church. If we are members of the church, the church is pushing us up to God. And the other members of the church, the saints in heaven, they pull us up. A little push from below in the church, especially in the liturgy, and the pull from above by the strong members of this body, and we get to the desired place in the kingdom of God. That's why we cannot be saved outside the church. St. Paul says in the epistle to the Ephesians that we can only comprehend the depth and the height and the breadth and the length of the love of Christ only with all the saints, he says. We cannot comprehend, we cannot embrace this fullness of the love of Christ outside this wondrous assembly of the saints. And that is what happens in the liturgy. Because if it is Christ, if it is Christ who offers the liturgy and he is offered in the liturgy, wherever the king is, there are, there are all the armies of his saints, angels and all, all the armies of the saints. Those who offer a sacrifice of love in their preparation for the liturgy come to the temple bearing gifts for God, gifts bringing inspiration and imparting joy, peace and grace to the brethren. The greater 
the greater and more attentive our preparation, the fewer and stronger will, will our entry be into the family, that is the communion of God. In one of the hymns of Theophany, it says, where the king is present, there his only also goes. That is to say, where Christ is, the king of heaven and earth, there are the orders of the heavenly spirits. His all holy mother, the saints, the archangels and angels, and also all the Christians who have received the gift of the Holy Spirit and struggle for their perfection in all the places of God's dominion. Contrarywise, when we go to the divine liturgy without having prepared, we are not being fair to God and to our brethren, because we do not have any gifts in our heart to offer God and with which to enter this marvelous communion with the other members who are, who are bearing gifts in the liturgy. Therefore, depending on how much they have prepared for the service, the faithful maintain the warmth of their home, so that when they, they come to church, they have gifts, they have gifts for God and their brethren. We are not speaking here simply about material gifts, like the goats and lambs which the Hebrews brought to God as offerings. Now they bring now they bring as gifts their heart full of the womb, full of the womb of faith. A, a faith that worketh by love, says St. Paul. Full of the light of God's word from constant study of the gospel and full of the strength which the mystery of God produces in their, in their home. The hope and expectation they bear with him incites the faithful to exclaim and say to God, Thine own, of thine own, we offer unto thee in all and for all, at the center of the liturgy. In other words, these things that are yours, from the things you have given, we offer them to you to be, according to the commandments thou hast given us, when thou provided everything we need to live and to be saved. And he receives their gifts, God receives their gifts, bread and wine, things which are insignificant in their incense, but which become precious because the faithful have placed in them all their, all their life, their expectation in the Holy of Holies, and finally their whole life and humility. The Lord then accepts them, blesses them, and makes them his body and blood. That is, he also adds to them all the power and grace which were in his body after the resurrection and gives them back to us, saying, the holy things unto the holy. That moment when the priest says, the holy things unto the holy, this is the voice of God to his people. If the faithful have placed all their life in the gifts, they will succeed in exchanging them. In return, they will receive all God's life, all his grace, all his blessing, in show the fullness of salvation. I was impatient and I spoke to you before I came to reading it. In order for the door of the grace of God to open again, first of all, we must thank him unto the end for all that he has given us till now. Thus, we fulfill the following words of the Lord. In if ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own, says in the gospel. And that is a very strange word. It is difficult to understand it. But I think the meaning is this, according to the interpretation 
of my fathers in God. In other words, man cannot receive the greater fullness of God's grace if he has not first responded with a gratitude befitting God for all, for all the alternations in his life till now by the right hand of the Most High for all the gifts he has given us so far. Thanksgiving, therefore, is the zeal which ought to possess the children of God. It is so pleasing to God that the great Apostle Paul urges us to present all our petitions to the Lord, having first given thanks for everything. He says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And in everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God, in Christ Jesus concerning you. In such, a blessed, in such a blessed communion of grace, we find true and dynamic divine inspiration, which allows no rest on earth, but goes from faith to more perfect faith, from hope to confidence in the living Jesus who raises even the dead, from love to a greater fullness of love, and from a single light to the perfect day of his kingdom that knows no even tide. Where is the place and the eternal rest of our souls with all his saints and the spirits and the spirits of just men made perfect? Forgive me. This is my poor my poor presentation. I insisted so much on, on thanksgiving because St. Paul says some words which are very illuminating. He says that we have not received the spirit of this world, which elsewhere he says is a spirit of arrogance, of pride, of ingratitude. We have not received the spirit of the world, he says, but we have received the Spirit of God, to know the things granted to us by Him. That is to say, the Spirit of God is a spirit of humility that illumines the heart to see all the benefits of God and offer thanksgiving to Him for, for all His benefits. So, so, humility and thanksgiving, humility and thanksgiving go hand in hand. Of the faithful. And thanksgiving cleanses the eye of the heart. Then we acquire a spiritual vision to know the traces of God's benevolent providence everywhere and follow these traces, which are the traces of His will, and in His will there is life. Okay. The world 
lies in sin, in the passions. The word has two meanings. One meaning, it signifies, it signifies the passions. And, uh, and it is an enmity to God. The other is the creation of God, for which he even gave his only begotten son, that the world may be saved by him, by his sacrifice. Now, when we speak about the world, it's the world that blinds our soul because of the, of the lusts that there are in this world. Yes, it is a struggle for us to avoid the vanity of this world, which destroys really our heart, makes it unearthed, makes it earthy, and not a spiritual radar receiving all the waves of the grace of God. So, first is to avoid the vanity of this world. Second, to avoid being deceived by the potents and the values of this world, which are an abomination in the sight of God. All the things that the world consider, considers as precious and valuable, they are an abomination to the Lord. So we must have it in mind and not be deceived by the values and the patterns of, and the principles of this world. Third, we, we must avoid the illusion, the delusion that from to which even many many members of the church are led to it, to it. That is to say, not to think that we can make the love of this world combat, compatible with the love of God. Because the love of this world is an enmity to God. And uh, we must know clearly that we have to receive spiritual freedom, we must be dead unto this world. It's what St. Paul says. To me, unto me, the world is dead, and I unto the world. There are two, stage, there are two stages there which correspond to two degrees of spiritual freedom. The first stage is when we run away from the passions of this world, not geographically, but spiritually, when we refuse to go the way this world goes. And many things have now become even normal for many people, and they accept them. But they are really abomination before God. So the first degree of spiritual freedom is not to be conformed to the ways of this world and to run away from the habits and from the passions of from the passions of dishonor of this world. Then we become spiritually free, but only part. The second stage is when St. Paul says, and I am dead unto the world. In other words, not only to run away from, from the passions of this world, but to uproot the passions of this world from within us, from our heart, so that the world no longer spies, finds us as victims of his desires and of his passions. So, these are the two degrees of spiritual freedom. And this is the covenant we make in baptism. What do we say to God in baptism? In baptism that we shall be dead unto sin and alive unto God. So this is the covenant we made in baptism. When we enter the church, this is the covenant we make every time we repent and we go to confession. And this is the covenant we renew every time we go to the liturgy. The Lord said, As my Father sent me into the world, and I live by my Father, so must he 
who eats my body and drinks my blood, not live, live for himself, but, but for me. That is the covenant. Really, we repeat in every liturgy. We receive the body and blood of Christ at the term, at the condition that we shall be dead unto sin, unto the world, and alive unto God, fulfilling his commandments. Until his commandments become the sole law of our existence. And that is the, the desired state of divinization which gives us the blessing of Gentile strengthen that world of the spirits made perfect. Forgive me. I don't know if I answer your question. Is there anyone else? Thank you, Father, for coming. I have a question regarding um, discernment and judgment. When you're dealing with, say, a person um, in your life, and they might be um, harmful for you to uh, continue to be maybe a friend with that person, and I, I just have an issue with, should I still keep being a friend with them, even though they're Harmful? <laughs> yes, I'll tell you something. Once, this is a story and ever to be remembered. Forgive me, may God preserve that person about whom I will speak without naming the person. There was a doctor in Europe who worked in a clinic and the chief of the clinic was terribly against her and making her life very difficult. So much that she despaired of her medical profession and she wanted to give it up. And she went and she went to confession and she said all that to his spiritual father. And his spiritual father said to him, let's try one thing, one thing more before you give it up. Go back to your work and keep thanking God for letting this man be in the path of your life to show you how far is your heart from him, testing you, trying you, and showing you how far is your heart from him. She started thanking God for letting this man come into her life to show you how far her heart was from God. And within two weeks, this chief doctor of the clinic came to her and made a bow, and made a bow to her and said to her, Either you are no longer the same person or I made a mistake. Forgive me. Well, there is the power. There is a power of the of things leading with self accusation. I, I spoke in the talk that the greatest commandment is when we have fulfilled all the commandments to say to ourselves that we are useless servants. And we tried to fulfill that and within two weeks she brought some she she, she brought some victory she brought she brought such a victory. So, how to discern and how to judge? I think if we keep a contrite spirit, we won't have to discern and we won't have to judge. People who have a contrite spirit, already they are led by the spirit. And God enlightens them what is true and just, what is right. When we have a contrite spirit and we maintain it with our personal repentance, we never let a word of judgment go beyond our throat. It's cut at the throat by the, 
contrite spirit of the heart. And we never judge our fellows because we remember that we, that we are worse than our own. This is the spirit of the Christians. And in, monast in the monasticism, the discipleship, if it is a successful discipleship, prayed for in the spirit, it will be to this awareness that you are worse than all. Not because of some inferiority com com complex, but because of the love you have for God's commandment. Because of an abounding inspiration of the heart to be pleasing to God either by death or by life. And this is the perfection of life. We make it a purpose, says St. Paul in the Epistle to the Corinthians, chapter 5, 8 to 10. He says, We make it a purpose, whether, whether we are in the body or outside the body, that is to say, whether we, we live or whether we die, we make it a purpose to be pleasing to Him. If we are like that, we don't even have to discern or to judge. Forgive me. Thank you. favor of rules. Christ died for, for us in order to free us from the curse of the law of the Jews. And why should we be enslaved to, to rules? But if we are children and we have not yet received education, in spiritual education, then we need a certain rule in the beginning. But there is a danger with the rule. Sometimes we learn to perform it very easily. And we are satisfied that we have done great things, no progress at all. If we don't manage to fulfill it again, we are tormented because we don't manage to fulfill it. There is no peace. The golden rule that we received from our fathers of the fourth of the fourth century in the desert of Egypt was to do everything you can before God and leave the rest to Him. In that there is humility and peace. Because we don't put our trust in us, but in Him who can make up for what we are lacking. But this is spiritual freedom. And spiritual freedom is dangerous as well. We have, we have to really be honest before God and always do what we can, not less. But all that we can and leave the rest to God. Then we have a golden rule in our life. But uh, we mustn't consider the rule we are given pedagogically for, from our fathers. And we mustn't consider it as a burden. But there's a, a norma which is to make us <coughs> to say, ready to advance in the spiritual life. 
I'll tell you uh, uh, another example from life. <coughs> you want to become a writer, for example. You want to become a writer. You cannot just become a writer. You have to study word and grammar of the language, read other great authors and writers, and then suddenly you form your own style and you forget about everybody and you write and you, you are a writer. And you have to study well before the grammar and the syntax of the, the of the language. It is exactly what we are doing in the church. In the beginning we have to read the prayers of the church. For example, the prayers before Holy Communion, they are worth reading until our last breath. They have such a strong spirit of self. How to say? That of the, they have a strong spirit of that greatest commandment we spoke before. So, if we want to be free and to be within the spirit of the church, let us learn well the, the grammar of the church or the, or the language of God in the, in the prayers of the church and in his scriptures. And then prayer will be sweet and come, come forth from our heart. I don't know. I remember when I was a young man and I was trying to learn about the rubrics, the structure of the of the services of our church, which is quite complicated. To me, in the beginning, it seemed to me oh, so difficult <coughs> to understand because unless you do them, you open the books and you do them, you don't learn them just from listening to the services. And, and I was given the task to be in charge of the, of the rubrics of the services and to learn the services. And uh, Father Sufroni, my father in God, said to me, learn the typical word so that you can, so that you may transgress it if you want to. <laughs> what does he mean? Learn well the mind of the of the services, of the rubrics, of the typical. So that if you want to transgress it, if one day you want to make the service of Martins instead of two hours, one hour, you will know what to leave out as secondary and what you must keep as primary. You understand? And it is in, the, in everything is like that. You must learn well in order to have the freedom, to have the joy. Learn well. Learn, learn well the language of God, which is expressed expressed in the scripture and in the prayers of the church. And then you have a great joy and freedom to speak to you in your own words, but you will be within the framework of his spirit and of his mind and the mind of the church. If I can please ask you to give advice to parents. Uh, how do we help our children become aware of the importance of Thanksgiving? And how do we as parents practice Thanksgiving with them so that um, they can be honest and genuine? Please. Yes. Very good question. Very good question. First of all, I spoke already to the priest the other day when we met upstairs here that uh, parents must not behave, behave to the children with parental authority, but it's equal and even if they come to put themselves under them and explain things humbly and even beg them humbly and never with parental parental authority, you gain their love and their trust more if you speak as they are required. And, as, and even if you can put yourself below them, that's the Lord, that's the example the Lord gave us when he spoke with the Samaritan woman, with Madonna, with Nicodemus. Look, Samaritan woman comes to him 
and the Lord puts himself under her as in need of her, saying to her, give me to drink. She immediately felt the great honor. She started conversing with him about serious issues of her life. And at the end, she, the Lord made out of her a woman equal to the apostles. Because and all his coming to us, the Lord came and put himself under us, under us all, in order to be able to lift us all in this in his kingdom. So we must behave with with the children, with not with the parental authority, but as we said. And a simple thing. When we eat, if we say prayers before we eat, if we thank God. Everything about which we give thanks to God, it becomes ours. If we don't pray before we eat something, it's like having stolen it from God, because it's not ours, it's God's. But by giving thanks to God, it becomes ours. That's one way. And I, I remember I was sometimes difficult to my mother with food, because I didn't she, her food was very simple and she was too busy in the fields all the time. She had no time to uh, occupy herself with uh, cooking. So she just did something very quickly because she had to run to the fields and work. And I would make, and when I became, you know, I don't like it, and I, and, and I became like that, with that mood, she would say, but God will make it punished from your side if you are not, if you are ungrateful, she will say to me. And I used to get scared. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, we must say in our own life, even su with such small things, that we are people of giving thanks, are people of thanksgiving. And they will learn from us. But above all, pray for your children. And say to God all the things you want to say to them. Tell God all the things you want to tell your children, and you'll find a way to put them in their hearts. I know many people who did that, and they were most successful. We have time for just one more question uh, before lunch, and then I'll make a couple of short remarks. Thank you, Father. Another one question I have from the family of the uh, generation of priests. But I've been raised in a communist country, so I have a grandson, and I have kind of questioned myself because we had so difficult life. Should I baptize? Should I? Do you want to baptize him, the grandson? But because of our hard lives, I think. If I baptize him, his life will be, he has to perish uh, or worship to the God, to the Christ, right? Yes, I think that's right. You understand my question? Well, she was born in a communist country, and she's concerned that if she should baptize her grandson, she's afraid that it may be. But it's not for her to, it's not for you to baptize your grandson, it's for the parents of the child. Yeah, they all, they all baptize my daughter, everybody. But, you know, it's time to baptize him. And I have debated myself if we go to church and take the baptism for my grandson, if his life is going to be hard. I don't know. Don't baptize by force. Don't baptize by force. It must be done peacefully and in concern. Of his, or, or of his parents. Of course, uh, when, when we enter the church, our life it would be in a way more difficult than the life of the people of the world. But th there is hope. There is such a living hope, and there are so many other things and blessings that we enjoy that the world doesn't even think about. Externally, if we didn't have this great hope and this great, yes, if we didn't have the faith and the great hope, the living hope in our hearts, 
will be the most miserable people in the world, says St. <laughs> Paul, in the epistle to the Corinthians. Of course, we are in the church, we are disciples of the cross. But we are at the same time disciples of the blessedness that comes from the cross. Look at all the beatitudes of the Lord. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When we depend ourselves on him and we become poor and nothing for him, we become a suitable material for him to recreate us. We, are, we, we accept the cross of spiritual poverty, but immediately we, we become partakers of the blessedness of the kingdom. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. If we mourn for our spiritual poverty and for our sinfulness, we are comforted by the Spirit of the Comforter, by the Holy Spirit. So all the time, if we take the cross of repentance, in all this, in, in all the activities we have before God, we shall be partakers of His incorruptible consolation, partakers of His blessedness. We are disciples of the cross, friends of the cross, but at the same time we are disciples of God's blessedness and incorruptible consolation, forgiveness.